Uh, our uh, Vice Chair, uh, Ms. Capps. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to each of you. You've been spending a lot of time the last couple of days here on Capitol Hill, and it's very valuable for us to have your expertise and to be kept abreast of what's going on. A different set of questions from me, please. Uh, the recommendation for people, and I'll, I'll address this to you, Dr. Vanderweg, and all of you have come, and, uh, but I want to just sort of go from topic to topic. I have three. Uh, 47, uh, your, the recommendation is if you have the symptoms, uh, call your health provider. 47 million Americans don't have regular access to uh, health care. It seems likely that if this progresses and becomes worse, emergency rooms and hospitals, other public places are going to be on the front line of uh, receiving all of these uh, patients because they would be the first place, the only place certain people, uh, many people could turn. Our emergency rooms are already overflowing and uh, it's clear that uh, responding to a, a pandemic would be more than they could handle under existing circumstances. Our goal now, simultaneously, is to, to work toward providing health care for all Americans, access to health care. In the meantime, um, I, I want to comment from you on uh, what kind of emergency coverage or is it, it, do you recommend a particular plan that we could speedily enact to provide coverage or uh, for, in this case of an emergency? Well, Madam, I really appreciate your linkage between preparedness and health security and health reform because I think those are yes. intricately, they are intertwined in a way that people don't always realize, and I, I appreciate that. Medical surge is a function of people, facilities, supplies, equipment, and systems. And what we've seen with investments that Congress has appropriated to us in hospital preparedness is the emergence of systems that rely on the fact that no one place is going to be able to manage the mm -hmm. flow. So how do we work collectively to share that flow in a way that takes the burden off? We've seen extraordinarily good examples of this in a wide variety of states, Illinois, Minnesota, North Carolina, et cetera. These are best practices that have been put in place that these states have already done a significant job of analyzing people, equipment, facilities. Those are the kind of best practices we would extend to communities that are still trying to find the answer to that problem. Uh, the emergency management assistance compacts between states also offers us ways for hospital care, not so much emergency department evaluation, but for hospital care. There are good models out there and best practices that we can share with communities. Thank you. And, Mr. Chairman, I would hope that we could uh, keep this discussion going as, uh, as the days go, in, in case there's a way that we should be responsive to you as well. Right. And now, um, another challenge, uh, Dr. Chukat, uh, um, for, the, for the provider in the household, um, uh, you are calling on people to stay home if they're ill. Uh, to prevent the limit, uh, the spread of, of the H1N1 flu, but millions of people work every day but don't have any sick leave, don't have any time that they can take. And with this uh, economic uh, uncertainty, they're very reluctant to stay home from work and may go to work with symptoms or have to send their kids to school because there's no one at, to stay at home. This is going to be difficult to contain the flu. Um, we do have legislation in the works, Senator Kennedy and, and, and Congresswoman DeLauro, planning to reintroduce the Healthy Families Act. I'm co-sponsoring it, but that, and, and that would guarantee, sev guarantee seven sick days a year. Uh, first of all, you could help us with support of that kind of legislation for the next <laughs> event. And maybe if you have any thoughts of what you or we could do together to respond to this crisis. You know, just, just a few comments. Um, health, health in the workplace and health in the family is very important. It's a central component of public health. And we did see during the SARS um, epidemic that in Canada some of the hospitals were really taxed trying to figure out how to make sure that healthcare workers, including contract employees, would stay home, whether furloughs needed to be um, used. And it was a very difficult circumstance to make sure that health was taking a front seat and that the, the right. rules could be worked out. So we, we would just be supportive in making sure that health is, um, is addressed. Thank you. I have one final question. There's not a lot of time for it, and maybe some ongoing conversation about this is to either any of you, because workforce shortages are something that you are experiencing in every of your agencies and of all of our local and state uh, public health facilities. Um, 
11,000 public health workers are, are due to be laid off because of state budget cuts, attrition over the past year. Um, this is exactly who you are depending on even as we speak for uh, solutions. Um, do you recommend uh, any suggestions for us to help you do this or to recruit more or to implement anything? Uh, a month ago, I was the local health officer in Baltimore, Maryland, working with Congressman Sarbanes and, and others. Um, and I think uh, the, your point is very well taken that a lot of the things that are being planned at the, the federal level really depend on the state and local public health authorities to implement the emergency use authorizations that we granted give a lot of um, have a very clear role for state and local in how they hand out medicines that may be important to people. Eventually, if there's a vaccine, that's going to be delivered through the public health infrastructure and ensuring that uh, that, that infrastructure is strong is, is extremely important and I, I know is uh, very important to the administration. My time is up, but there's more to talk about. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.